Hello everyone, my name is Christian Steinmetz, and today I'll be talking to you about our work, Automatic Multitrack Mixing with a Differentiable Mixing Console of Neural Audio Effects, which is work in collaboration with Jordi Pond, Santiago Pascual, and Joan Serra. To begin, I want to talk about what is mixing and what is automatic mixing. So in the process of creating a song, the you know, musicians will work with a recording engineer that's going to record, in many cases, individually these different instruments. And once they've been recorded, the mixing engineer's goal is to create a cohesive mixture of those different elements. And in general, this is carried out using a digital audio workstation where the audio engineer has the ability to you know, apply processing to each channel individually and create a whole mixture. In general, this involves processes like applying plugins which involves things like compressors, equalizers, reverb, and many more different types of effects, as long as considering things like stereo panning of the different elements and setting the level of the faders of each element within the mix. And this is a very difficult task that audio engineers, you know, spend a lot of time practicing and studying in order to hone their craft. Automatic mixing aims to automate this process by, anal by building a system that analyzes the input recordings and produces a mix that sounds good. So, you know, predict some set of parameters or mix that will, you know, be a good starting place, at least for the mixing engineer. And this has applications first, you know, for amateur audio engineers and musicians who want to create a better quality mix, and also has applications for professionals just to, you know, expedite their process by giving them a starting point. So there have been past approaches over the past 15 years to try to address this problem, and some of the most successful involve expert systems, or also known as knowledge engineering. And in these approaches, they're generally referring to the literature or interviewing audio engineers to kind of build some uh, set of rules that can be used to create mixes based on the inputs. And while this you know, can work for very limited use cases and produces explainable decisions, it really lacks sufficient complexity to uh, generalize to real-world use cases that have you know, many different tracks, many different instruments, different genres, and things like that. So in addition, there's also been an interest in machine learning approaches for this problem that use classical ML algorithms. And this has the you know, ability to provide much greater model flexibility since we can try to learn these mixing conventions. But they've really been hindered thus far because of the absence of parametric data. Here, by parametric data, we mean we would need to have the value of every single processor and plug-in in an entire mix for many songs. And this just really isn't feasible to collect, not to mention that different audio engineers use different DAWs, they use different uh, plugins. so kind of creating a standardized system for that is certainly very challenging. And as a result, thus far, these systems, while they work for limited use cases, really haven't seen, you know, generalization that enables them to be used in real-world music production use cases. For more details on these references and other, you know, a full list of papers relevant to this, check out the website below. So then our main question with this work is, you know, can we apply deep learning to the, for the first time to this problem to enable us to learn these mixing techniques or mixing conventions directly from the individual tracks of a mix, along with a mix of those tracks made by a human audio engineer. Unfortunately, though, there's a number of key challenges that are somewhat unique to this problem of applying deep learning to multi-track mixing. The first of that is evaluation of mixes, you know, what makes a good mix according to who, because this is not only a, you know, technical task, but also a creative or artistic task. There's also this problem of highly variable inputs in that there's no consistent size or structure to the inputs in general for different mixes. So some mixes may have just four recordings, some mixes may have upwards of 100, and there's also no you know, guarantee that there will be a guitar. Some will have many guitars, some will have none. So having a system that can adapt to this is key. Also, there's a requirement for high fidelity. You know, we need high sampling rates and almost no artifacts for this to be useful in a music production context. And finally, we need to provide some level of user interaction. Since our system is going to produce kind of a starting point, audio engineers need to be able to you know, see what that prediction was, what were the parameters, and also need the ability to go in there and adjust it so it you know, fits their goals. So as a starting point, we consider that we could use traditional DSP audio effects as a strong inductive bias for this task. 
And that may look like something here on the left where we have multiple audio channels going into the mixing console as well as to a neural network called the controller network here. And its job is to analyze the signals and predict the parameters for each channel in the mixing console, uh, shown as those knobs there. The problem though is that by default that there are some processors in the you know mixing console which we cannot easily compute gradients for. So what we propose instead is to train a neural network to model a single channel of the mixing console and then copy this neural network for as many input channels as there are and then this will allow us to construct you know a differential mixing console proxy so here's a more detailed look at our proposed approach in which we have the controller network on the left and the transformation networks on the right, which are emulating the individual channels of the mixing console. Note here that we apply weight sharing across all the input channels. So every encoder here is the exact same network, just copied n number of times. Same for the post processor as well, and the transformation network. And this weight sharing essentially enables us to handle you know, unknown number of tracks at inference time uh, and during training. So as I said before, the encoder's role here is really to extract features from the inputs that will be useful for creating the mix. The post-processor's goal then is to, given this information about the input and all the other input channels, which is given by this context vector, we will then predict the parameters for the respective channel. And these parameters are passed on to the transformation network along with the original audio, such that that transformation network can, in the time domain, process the audio and produce a final mix by summing all of those outputs. So in the next step, we're just going to go through the different subsystems. And here we consider the encoder, which its goal is to extract information to make mixing decisions. And in this case, the encoder is a simple CNN with the VGG-ish type that's been pre-trained on audio set. And it takes as input a male spectrogram and outputs a 128 dimensional embedding. And we apply this same encoder to all of the inputs so that we can generate these embeddings. Now that information gets passed on to each post processor, which is trying to aggregate that information in order to make mixing decisions. So here we can see that the post processor uh, takes as input two different embeddings. First, the input embedding for this perspective channel, as well as this context embedding, which is computed simply by taking the mean across all input channel embeddings. And then we apply this post processor once for every channel, where we switch out that input channel embedding each time. And what that will be trained to do then is to predict a vector of parameters that will be passed on to the transformation network, which these parameters are directly the human interpretable parameters of a normal mixing console. So finally, let's talk about the transformation network, which is going to be trained to perform the type of processes that are normally employed in mixing. Here we train this network, in this case, a temporal convolutional network to operate in the time domain on an audio signal. And it takes as input two things, the audio signal itself, as well as those parameters we mentioned before, which correspond to the EQ gains and et cetera. And this model, we can pre-train it beforehand before the mixing task. And we train it just by having some large data set of audio and by having a set of a mixing console, you know, implemented in code that we can generate randomly parameters and then create these input output pairs based on that real signal chain. Now for simplicity, we consider two different model configurations. First, just this gain plus panning as we call it, where the transformation network is completely omitted. And this enables us to train larger models uh, due to memory constraints. And in this case, we don't have the full channel, but just this gain and panning, which allows you to create a pretty decent mix as a starting point. We additionally also consider this one with the transformation network modeling those three processors in the center here. And this has then the gain, the EQ, compressor, reverb, and panning. And in this case, we can then have this for every single channel in the mixing console. We also consider two different data sets in this task. First, the ENST drums data set, which is an easier but less realistic mixing task. And that's because there are recordings from three drummers here that all follow the same eight channel structure. So, you know, kick drum, snare drum, and so on. But what's more realistic is something like MedleyDB, which we consider, which is 
much more challenging. And that's because this data set has complete songs with diverse styles and a varying number of tracks from two all the way up to 100. So we need our system to be able to handle this variability, as well as the fact that there's different genres and things like that. So to compare our model in these tasks, we also consider three baseline approaches. Uh, first is a mono mix, where we simply take all of the input channels and sum them together. There's also a random mix, where we simply randomly set the gain and panning for each element in the mix. Finally, we consider a deep learning baseline by adapting a model that has no or inductive bias for the mixing task based upon the wave unit architecture. So while the original model was proposed for source separation, we kind of propose to use it for the reverse in doing this mixing task, where the input is instead, you know, n channels of input and the output is a stereo mix. To handle this problem of multiple inputs, we always train with a fixed number of input channels and simply put in silence in input channels that are not used in the mix. So now let's hear a demo of these different systems so you can get an idea of what it sounds like. As a final step, we carried out a perceptual evaluation where audio engineers listened to the different methods and different mixes of the same songs and tried to rate them on a scale from 0 to 1. So in the first case, we considered mixes for the ENST drums dataset with just the gain and panning configuration. And here you can see the, our kind of summary of these results is that listeners on average rated our mixes from our system higher than the baselines in this task. And Actually, they rated uh, mixes from the wave unit the lowest since there was presence of artifacts in some of those mixes. As a second test, we evaluated also on MedleyDB where we consider the full mixing change, which is a much harder process. And while we find that our mixes do exceed the baselines and rate, were rated more higher in some cases, they were also cases where the baselines exceeded them. And this kind of points to our main point that adding all these processors really makes the challenge of uh, creating a good mix um, a lot harder. And future work will look at essentially expanding the amount of data that we can use here and using bigger models to try to handle this better. Essentially, as we increase the complexity of the mixing chain itself, it seems likely that we will need more and more data in order to learn that space of how to create a good mix. So in summary, really our major contribution is the design of this deep learning based multi-track mixing system. And this end-to-end -end mixing architecture, we demonstrate, you know, it has a number of nice properties, mainly that we can train with a limited number of examples, that it learns these mixing conventions directly from the stereo mixes without any parameters. Uh, it makes no assumptions about the input sources or how many sources there will be, and enables users to adjust the mixing results, providing us with this level of interpretability. And I encourage you to check out the companion website here, which you can find all of the listing examples from our tests, as well as more details and the paper itself. 
Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much.